So, for many, what makes a nation seems obvious. It's history and it's people. But does that mean Native Americans and Australians should control their lands? Should Ireland belong to the Irish? Is nationhood an accident of previous tribal battles over borders and a means of holding on to the spoils? Or is it a shared culture and community that is for the benefit of all? So first, uh, on my left here, we have Elif Sarakan. Elif is a Kurdish rights activist. She comes to the festival today shortly after her visit to Rojava in northern Syria. Next, we have David Blunkett, former Home Secretary. Uh, David was one of the most respected members of Tony Blair's cabinet. On top of the Home Secretary position, Blunkett also served as Education and Employment Secretary and Work and Pensions Secretary. And in 2015, he was awarded a peerage and became Baron Blunkett. Dear, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then last but not least, we have Eric Kaufman. Uh, Eric is a Canadian professor of politics at Birkbeck. He's a specialist in nationalism and demography. And if that's not enough, he is also the author of several books, including White Shift, Populism, Immigration, and the Future of White Majorities. So now you know our panel, let's hear their thoughts on Are Borders Simply Accidents of History? Aleph, why don't you kick us off? Uh, one thing that I think people, everyone can agree on is the fact that borders and nations are, were and are a political project. So therefore, it was built and created by people or systems or ideas of uh, very particular ideas. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, the idea of borders and nations, I like that this, top, that this title also has the idea of history in it. And I think why that's relevant is that the idea of borders and nations, especially you know, on the scale of the his of history of humanity, but also even civilization, are very new, uh, to, are, are very new phenomenons. The nation state and therefore borders uh, are very new. And I think also one of the things we can comfortably say is they never have really brought anyone, any, uh, any nation for that matter, any long term or lasting peace. For full liberation, you must overcome and essentially bring down uh, all forms of oppression and enslavement and therefore this includes borders and the nation state as well. Now hopefully we'll get a, get a, a chance to speak about nations and be able to talk about the difference between nations and the nation state in our discussion but when I talk about borders I, I mean the nation states. Thank you very much for setting out those initial thoughts. Uh, so David the same question to you, are borders simply accidents of history? Well I think those of us who are um British by heritage have got to be very careful how we address this because our imperial history has been a disaster in terms of drawing other people's borders uh, in South Asia and Iraq and across the world. So it's with some temerity that I would say that the, there are different borders that people need to belong. They have a sense of needing an identity that they can share with other people and it might be language and it might be language and faith and it might be culture and it might be drawing down on sometimes erroneously their history but it's it's about people as gregarious human beings wanting to be together and when when they start the process of expanding from a close-knit community identity then you get into the imperial, either military or economic imperialism, uh, where other people's <laughs> borders are encroached on and their way of life is infringed. So I would say that for many people in the world, their borders are a few miles from where they live and work still. In my community that I grew up in, um, people still are, are not, if you like, citizens of the world. They may fly on holiday, but it's not common, whereas for many people here at Hay, it would be, and we would see the world in a different, from a different perspective. So I think we come at it uh, in that guise. Here in Britain, of course, we've, we've had the Danes and the Vikings, we've had the Normans, we've had people coming in, whether it's Huguenots or uh, people fleeing from persecution across the world, the Windrush. Interesting about the Windrush, because when they came uh, 70 years ago, they saw Britain as the motherland, so the borders that they were seeing weren't borders based on geography. They were based on what they'd been, inc what inculcation had taken place in terms of a, a combined history. 
I don't think people would see that now. They didn't get a great, great welcome from the motherland, uh, as we all know. I've tried, and perhaps we come back to this, to say that developing common values for citizenship and recognising that wherever anyone came from is the real challenge for the future. Thank you very much, David. Uh, okay, last but not least, Eric, your thoughts on this question of borders simply being an accident of history? Right, so uh, the question is, are borders accidents of history? And I think the truth is, in part, they are. I mean, as, as Charles Tilley, the uh, political historian, once said, uh, national borders are the high water point of dynastic expansionism. And we know that post-colonial nation states, a lot of their borders are straight lines, which were drawn by the colonial power. So yes, um, borders are in some degree an accident of history, but at the same time, we also know that collective will has also shaped the location of national borders. If we go back to ancient Israel, and if you look in the Old Testament talking about the borders of Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Now, there are, of course, there are many concepts of the promised land in the Bible. That's only one of them. I don't pretend it's the only one. But this is to say that groups were already talking about some kind of territorial reference points even back in ancient times. And certainly as we come through history, um, there are many instances, if you think of the Poles, more recently South Sudan or, or East Timor, where it's not just great power deals stitching up where the borders are, even though that's important, <clears throat> but it's also some sort of a, a national self-determination claims. So I just want to suggest that it's both top-down statecraft, but also bottom-up collective will that, that, that is important. Um, I would also say that once the national boundaries crystallize in the modern nation state, um, and this is taught to the population through the media, mass education, mass literacy, you get a large-scale attachment to national borders in the population. And once that occurs, borders actually become real for a lot of people. Um, national identities for many people are very important. And as Michael Walzer, the political theorist, says, you cannot have um, national, you can't have communities without boundaries. So I'm afraid that boundaries are part of what it means to be a nation. That's where the common rights and duties that we owe to each other, the willingness to share wealth, uh, to engage in a demos, where that, where that ends. And that is a necessary part, I, I would argue, of, uh, of nation and national attachments. Last thing I'm going to say really which concerns migration because the book, my book is really about the rise of populism. Migration is central to that story. Um, and communal boundaries as expressed in national borders are very central to not just protection against invading armies but also to the migration question. We have to have migration but uh, nations do have an interest in regulating migration levels that could be controversial or maybe not. And I think we have to accept that that is part of what's emerged because of these national attachments that people have formed. They are therefore interested in this question of migration. And one of the reasons we are getting right-wing populism is because of a reaction, a response to migration. We can get into that in more detail. Okay, fabulous. Thank you very much for those opening pitches. Alif, I want to come to you first again. With our first theme, are borders more trouble than they're worth? Which I think inherently has within it an idea of the value of value of boulders, which maybe you want to call into question. What do you think about that opening theme? I mean, the short answer is yes. Uh, but, you know, when we talk about, you know, I think we really get into, we get into ideological territory when we start, when we start equating national identity or belonging with boundaries and borders. You know, we, we've seen, and unfortunately, we don't have much time to go into, you know, 5,000 years of the history of civilization. But, you know, one of the things that is important is that, you know, the idea of boundaries, you know, say the Middle East. I mean, obviously, I'm from, I'm from London, so I know the UK very well as well, but I also know uh, about the geopolitics of the Middle East. And, one of the things, so when I was in uh, northern Syria, actually not that recently, it was last April. Um, well, I suppose that's kind of recent. Um, one of the things that you see is ex like literally in one place that there's Kurds, Arabs, Assyrians, Turkmens, um, Syriacs, you know, so many different kind, uh, so many different uh, people who live in one place and every single one of those people also historically come from that place mm -hmm. so where do you b draw the boundaries and where do you draw the borders without 
without um, without then that those borders yet again creating uh, the oppression or the uh, denial of a, a particular people. For podcasts, talks, debates, courses and articles, visit the Institute of Art and Ideas. Click the link on screen now to iai.tv.